Well, I come from Argentina and my language is Spanish, but I will speak in English to have a more, more direct uh, comment with Professor Seligman. Um, first, I will underline some aspects of your paper that are really interesting, have been very interesting for me, and then make some questions. In the first place, I think that I was waiting for this paper during the workshop because I believe that uh, Professor Seligman is giving us here the opportunity of opening a relatively big window on the phenomenological and anthropological foundations of what would be the gift, the relation, the gift re relations. And this is, uh, in my opinion, is crucial to understand the relationship between the three spheres of market, state, and, and civil society. And he does it in a very interesting way, I think, because he puts the gift uh, in the center of the question and tries to, to show that uh, the gift is not a, a marginal phenomenon. It's not just an area, a sector of society or a sector of the economy, but is in the core of the social relationship. And this, uh, at the first sight, looks as, as a little bit uh, shocking because we tend to understand society in a more struct in more structural ways, uh, or we tend to use concepts as, as power or as uh, self-interest or, or whatever other traditions we 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 look at to understand the function, the general function of of society, and not uh, the gift. But. His argument is very strong because he goes directly to the anthropologic, cultural anthropological basis of, of the argument. And this uh, cultural anthropological core shows that the, more, the most uh, basic or primitive or I would say original forms of societies have been uh, clearly structured around the gift, the relation of gift understood in this broad sense, not in a, in a reductive sense. The, the idea, the first, well, we, we have many, many of Professor Seligman's uh, phrases that are very strong in showing this. He says, gifts stand at the core of relations between humans, but not only between humans, but also between humans and their gods. So here we have also the relation of the gift-giving uh, sphere with another more ontological and even theological basis, and it made me remember uh, Professor Father Escanone's view of, of the subject. This uh, anthropological core is also projected then afterwards by Professor Seligman to uh, another important that well, this anthropological core is, is based on the main authors of the anthropological tradition, mainly Maus and Malinowski. But then he goes to our times, more, more recent times, and he points to uh, social capital theories. Quoting Putnam, Fukuyama, Arrow, it's very interesting the way he puts together different kind of authors uh, that maybe come from different politi philosophical political traditions, such as Fukuyama and Putnam, but that they have this common uh, concept of trust as a form of, of gift, as the main uh, idea of what is the, the substance of uh, social relations. And then uh, he also, uh, shows us the conditions of what would be a phenomenology of gift and giving a gift and receiving a gift. And he makes this very interesting excursus into the concepts of memory, mimesis, and metaphor. Uh, he made me remember recurse narrative um, uh, description of, of social relationship and, and this, I think, shows us that uh, gift giving is not, if, is not just a mechanical thing 
that emerged automatically from a social evolution, but that also it, it has a, a kind of structural basis as is shown by the anthropologists, but at the same time it needs a subjective collaboration, a subjective cooperation given by this different conditions of memory, mimesis, and metaphor as results of subjective activity, of a narrative activity, of interpretation of what is going on with the gift-giving relation, gift-giving and, and receiving relation that uh, is in the basis of social relations. And, well, all the ideas that he, he brings up about memory and and mimesis are very interesting, and especially the, the metaphoric one uh, shows that uh, gift giving and gift receiving is never a simple repetition of a phenomenon that occurs automatically, but it's based in, uh, in a creative, in a voluntary action that uh, we all make to recreate this uh, gift-giving uh, relationships. The questions that I have are uh, mainly three. The first one is related with the affirmation that is taken uh, from the anthropological authors, from the anthropologists, where Professor Seligman, you say that uh, a gift is always something voluntary given but not freely given. Well, that, that would be very interesting to, to have a, a reflection by you because uh, it, it seems that all the work that you do in the phenomenological sphere showing the subjective uh, conditions of, of the relations of gift are in a certain sense structurally prepared by the circle that occurs in society in which we are obliged to participate and in that sense this is voluntary but not free. How can be at the same time something voluntary and not free? That would be the first question. Then a second question has to do also with freedom uh, and you say that gift in this view is thus a metonym for the core ties that bind us together in society is something given but not freely or purely, not without a context. It, it, it seems that, that this idea of, of a free gift uh, is, is not compatible, compatible with a context. When you have a context of antecedents and consequences, that is, that the gift is, is framed, then it cannot be free. I would, uh, I would say that why not, no? Why not? Uh, a gift can be at the same time framed or conditioned, I would say, but not, uh, not, not purely free, but at least free at, up to a certain point. Sorry? Yes, uh, you're, you're right. My second question, in, in fact, it was a comment on the first. Yes, you're right. The second question is about the gift in the market. Uh, you say, uh, quoting the anthropologists, that uh, mark that that the gift is uh, basically uh, on the general picture of society, on the general exchanges of society, but not in the in the um, in the market exchanges. Market exchanges are direct, immediate, and conditional, and so they could not be in themselves gifts. But the gift relationships of trust are more around the market in society, but not inside the market. And that touches directly our, our subject of, uh, of the possibility of having gift inside the market. That would be my second question. That would... And the third one is about the isolated uh, gift. That's very interesting when you say that uh, if gifts uh, are given in a context of receiving and giving, in, a, in the context of, of the circle are giving and receiving, these are really gifts. But when you give, for example, to a beggar, a solitary beggar, that 
uh, it's not a socially um, influential gift, but it's something isolated. I would ask you, why don't you think that maybe this um, seemingly isolated gift can become part, in a very secret way or not very well-known way, part of the circle? Muchas gracias, Profesor Juevel. Preguntas realmente muy importantes. La palabra, Profesor Estefano Samaño. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for your paper, which I found very stimulating and uh, intriguing at the same time. To be specific, not to waste my time. Let me start. I have three basic points. The first one is the following. You say, uh, right at the beginning of the paper, that the role of the gift uh, as um, a fundamental building block in the creation of society, I quote you, is similar to what economists call an externality. I have some difficulty understanding because that is not true. Because, as you know, after the Coase theorem, 1960, we know that uh, uh, externalities can be traded on an open market uh, as, uh, and so, I would say that gift is not similar or analog to external, but to a relational good. Because, and in fact, this point was taken in Laudato Si by Pope Francis, who demonstrated that he knows better economics than many economists, who in fact, even today, continue to analyze the environmental or ecological issue under the category of the cause theorem, which is uh, creating tremendous uh, disasters. I move to the second point. The conceptualization of gift uh, seems to me varies a lot according to the anthropological paradigm that is uh, adopted. In other words, uh, to capture the nature, the true nature of a gift, uh, we have from the beginning, not exposed, but exactly defined what is our anthropological vision. For instance, if within an individualistic paradigm, eh, as we know, the anthropological assumption is the Hobbesian one, homo homini lupus, every man is a wolf eh, versus another, another man. Now, it is obvious that if we stick to that eh, paradigm, gift eh, is no more than an opportunistic strategy. And so free gift, by, of course, cannot define. Why? Because wolves uh, do not, never make gifts. Have you ever seen a, a wolf making a gift uh, to another wolf or another? Of course not. And uh, Manville, uh, in his uh, fable of the beast, he, as you, we know, made a step forward. Because he said, not only the gift is impossible, but you should not make it. And in fact, he suggested in his book uh, that uh, the king, the, 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 the authority, should tax those people who make gifts. Because he says, he writes, that making gifts is a, a, the way to destroy society. So that is why, the, and in fact, we find, a, 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 let's say, a late application of that notion in Arrow that you quote. In his famous book published in 1974, Kenneth Harrow uh, writes, practices of gift are an important lubrificant of the social system. Uh, but that is important. What does it mean lubrificant? That is something non-essential. Not only, but if it is a lubrificant of the social system that presupposes that society already exists. But if society already exists, then gifts is no longer a building block in the creation of society. In other words, uh, what I want to stress uh, is that uh, the people like uh, Patnam, Fukuyama, Arrow, and many others are caught uh, in a sort of a pragmatic contradiction. And I'm, uh, I'm amazed that uh, people do not realize that. Because you see, uh, on one hand, uh, they realize that the gift act is important to create trust. And since they are intelligent people, they cannot deny that. Because trust, which is a fundamental element for a working, for instance, of a market system, is generated by gift giving. 
And they know that gift giving is important to the accumulation of reputational capital. But at the same time, they pretend to quote this within the individualistic setup. And that is a contradiction. Because within individualistic setup, you cannot have a gift in the sense that of your So the result of all that is the gift is just a, a different name for what? For donation. And we keep on confusing gift with donation. In Italian, we have two words, dono e donazione. The donation is an object. If I donate this pen to you, uh, that is a donation. Gift is an interpersonal relation. And so that is why this, within the individualistic paradigm, it would be impossible to prop conceptualize the notion. And that is important because the three aspects of gift giving that uh, you mentioned, memory, mimesis, and metaphor, which are very important, will never be recognized as relevant by an axiological individualist, etc. And that, to conclude on this, uh, helps us to explain why, for instance, French philosophers such as uh, Gaston Bachelard or Jean-Luc Marion, more recently, they tend to underline the so-called so suspiciousness of gift. Because they say, if I observe someone making a gift, I should suspect that, that is the, there is a trick underneath. Why is that so? Because within, I repeat for the last time, an individualistic setup, it is impossible to make a proper gift. Well, a similar discourse, but in a different, is, is to be done if we accept another paradigm, namely the deontological paradigm. As we know, there, is a, there are moral traditions which consider action complying with duty superior to those stemming from love. That goes back to Kant. And more recently, I have a quote from Max Weber in Protestant ethics, I quote from Max Weber, a higher ethical value is attached to the accomplishment of duty without love than to sentimental philanthropy. In other words, even within a deontological setup, it is practically impossible to talk about proper gift. Because within that setup, what we call gift is an expression of duty. And the duty should compel you to do that, etc. So my point is that we need to move to a relational paradigm if we want to understand the notion of gift. Now, the assumption typical of relational paradigm is what is written in the book by Genovesi, homo homini natura amicus, which means every man is by nature a friend to another man. Now, if I start from that premise, which is, as I said, anthropological premise, then I start understanding what is a gift. Because friends make gifts. Wolves do not make gifts. And the gift is an invitation to a relationship. Since when we re receive a gift, it induces an impulse to give back, etc. Now, this is important because um, it helps us to understand that the relational paradigm acknowledges the fact that I need the relation with the other, not in order for me to flourish. But at the same time, also the other needs a relationship with me to flourish himself or herself. So that is why we, I think we have reached the point where we have to be very clear about the taking of the anthropological part. Finally, and that is very quick, it's a direct question to you, Adam. As we know, how social practices such as gift giving that cause societal change can survive? Should these practices be supported by norms or not? And how do to decide if a social practice such as gift giving we care about is a norm and not, and, or not. And if it is a norm, what sort of norm it is? It seems to me that without uh, being able to answer this basic question, 
promoting practices of gift giving would be very, very difficult in reality. Thank you very much again, Aidan. Muchas gracias a usted, profesor Samani. Gracias por resaltar los aspectos relacionales. Y yo también tenía mis dudas sobre esta idea de la externalidad. Bueno, tiene la palabra el profesor Adam Seligman. Thank you both very, very much. Um, and you're going to give me now an hour and a half to answer, right? Um, or an hour to think and then half an hour to answer. Um, Thank you, first of all, for the correction about externality, and I will take that absolutely into account. Um, the issues that you raised, that everybody raised, was, uh, are, are huge. Um, let me try to begin with the easy ones, <laughs> which is lubricant. If you try to run your car without changing the oil, the mechanic will explain to you that it's not just something <laughs> that you can live without. You'll totally destroy your your engine. So I think that, that, that one should be aware of that. Um, both of your most important questions come back to what is the nature of the human being. If you think deeply about what your questions are, they have to do what is the nature of the human being. Um, I clearly don't agree either that man to man is a wolf or that man is by nature a friendly, a Rousseauian perspective. Um, I tend to accept Marx's position in the beginning of the German ideology that every relationship with nature is a dual relationship. It's a relationship with nature and a relationship with other human beings. That's how we exist as a species. We work together through a division of labor to intervene in nature. Everything we're talking about and have been talking about and will be talking about is how we do that in a way that will preserve nature and preserve ourselves. That's really the essence of it. And, and, and how we do that. Um, clearly, what did you, you had a great term, axiological individualists would not accept, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong, that <laughs> they wouldn't accept it. It might mean that they're wrong. Um, I think, though, that the, um, the issue, in, in a way, your question about duty and love comes back to voluntary but not free. Right? It, 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 and and, and um, this is very close to you know, Durkheim's notion that moral, moral norms are both desirable and obligatory, something that none of my students understand because in their life, what's desirable is usually not obligatory at all, and what's obligatory is generally not desirable, like studying for exams and coming to class. And um, actually, Durkheim's notion of desire and obligatory is exactly the Hebrew notion, the Jewish notion, I shouldn't say Hebrew, the Jewish notion of a commandment, of a mitzvah, which I'm sure exists, I'm sure, I assume exists in other traditions, of an act that is precisely both desirable and obligatory. So that's why I say this comes really back to the notion of what a human being is, not friend or, 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 uh, or lupus, but if we're constituted by this axis or only by this axis, yeah? And I tend to think we're constituted by this axis as well, and I gather most people here but do as if well. If I make just a, yes, a, yeah. a three seconds to explain the point. Take the case of prostitution. Prostitution is a voluntary act, but it's not a free act. Yeah, in the traffic at the case, for instance, is voluntary because, uh, you see, the person who practices prostitution decides to do that, but it's not a free act. So that is a way to, exp to answer to Carlos. <laughs> but that's something else. Um, I think that, um, I think that what bothered me in your intervention was it, it seemed to me that, which is perfectly legitimate, that you're ontologically um, positing the relational nature of human beings. That's fine. What I'm trying to do as a social scientist is explain the dynamics of that, not parting, not pausing it as an axiom from which I built, but how that works. And I'm saying, indeed, as you presented, that that works through the gift that it's a mechanism through which precisely that is how relationality works. 
and, and hence that's how society works, the relationality of society through the gift. So, so I, 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 it seemed to me that by the end of your presentation, you were actually, I thought, agreeing with at least the, the, um, the, 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 the outline of, of, um, of, of my presentation. Carlos, you, you talked about, which I think is a good question, about the gift outside and inside the market, right? <sighs> right, so Durkheim has this great notion, which I guess, I don't know if economists have or not, of the pre-contractual, right? Of what exists anterior to the conflict, to the, to the, to the contract. That is, what exists anter analytically anterior to the market, right? There are boundaries to the market. Not everything could be bought and sold on a market, right? I mean, you know, I can't go and sell enriched plutonium or heroin, for that matter, on the corner of Mass Ave and Com Ave, right? They'll get arrested, right? They're, so there, there are clear boundaries that are, you know, that there's no doubt that they emerge through conflict if we're talking about child labor laws, minimum wage, all, all sorts of labor regulation. But yet they're seen at this point, they're accepted, and what we're seeing in America now is how much certain aspects of what we all, what many of us thought were accepted as almost given are not given at all and people want to roll back the social contract to the progressive era or before the progressive era. But, and they become the framework within which a contract takes place, the kind of encumbrances on, on contracts. So that's the example for me of how the notion of the gift in terms of our understanding of our relationality structures the contract. So, in a constructive it could structure the contract in very, very different ways. You know, we, if we're in, I don't know, a Christian ecclesium in the Middle Ages, we can't give interest to one another. If we're in the, an Islamic ummah and we're a Christian minority, no matter how rich a community are, we are, no matter how great an architect it is, we can't have somebody build a church that's higher than a mosque, right? Even though in every technical way it's possible, but there are notions of what kind of contract is legitimate in a contract. If the highest mosque is 45 meters, you can't build a church that's 50 meters. Yeah, so again, there's, there's an external constraint on the workings of contract in the name of something else, and the name of something else is society as it is defined, different of an Islamic ummah, different if it's a Christian ecclesium, different if it's real existing socialism, different if it's cutthroat capitalism, right? But they're, they're, so, so, so that's how I think it works. We have to fill in a few steps, but that's how, how I think it works. Your final question about do I think we can normatize this? Um, so I didn't have time to go into it and it wasn't exactly germane to, um, to the topic and to my paper, but it is something I've been working on, writing on for a decade now. I think that in today's society, in general, not everywhere, and not, not in Italy to the same extent as in Los Angeles, right? But I think everywhere there is a, I mean, since the Reformation, there is a rejection of ritual, there is a suspicion of mimetic action, there is the excessive valuation of authenticity and sincerity. Um, in ethics, we see this with Kant, right? That a good will Right? All you need is a good will. As Williams and Nagel pointed out, that might be, but there still is a moral difference in saving somebody from a burning building or dropping to them to their death in the attempt of saving them, however good the will. So we have an excessive concern with sincerity, which is with self, which is with the non-relational, which is with the metaphoric aspect of gift giving, which is the Bourdieuian aspect that I can manipulate the gift for my own interest, rather than simply in the repetitive, mimetic aspect of life, which I think is central to gift giving, is central to society. Um, and we tend to degrade that more and more. And I think our, well, okay. So I think you can't normatize it and we are losing the ability to do it. And I think it's uh, dangerous. So go to church. Muchas gracias, Profesor Seligman. Ha pedido la palabra Monseñor Sánchez Orondo. Uh, profesor, uh, I think that it's very important to make some distinctions. Uh, what 
donation, give and charity, because charity is not only this description that you say. And in, in relation with the don, um, it's clear that it's completely ambiguous. And, and we have in the history of uh, Troya, as you remember, <laughs> Timio dona ferentes. So the, f the first thing that we have when one receives a don, when we have some experience in the life, <laughs> Timio. No, it's not clear that this. The, the, the beginning of a friendship. But it's the beginning of some kind of slaves. It's ambiguous. And in the contrary, the charity for me is the form pure high of, of the generosity of the, uh, because it's in relation of the other, but also more than the, the friendship because in relation of the other, but not have any, in, in, in say, any uh, idea of retribution. So this is, this is the question. Thanks. So there are three very different categories. So rather than go into the categories, I don't know Italian and I don't know the, the weight of each word, but you're absolutely right. Um, as all of you are, that the gift is ambiguous. And that's where Mouse begins his work, for those of you who remember, right? That two things are happening at the same time when a gift is given. We're establishing a relationship, but we're also establishing a relationship where you're indebted to me, right? So we're also, we're establishing a relationship, but one that is not devoid of power, but is very much um, connected to power. Um, but of course the giving back the, the, plays that out differently. And again, here Bourdieu's comment, which is again all about the aspects of the gift that you're discussing, right? That other side of ambiguity. Um, and they're there, and they're absolutely there, but we're human beings. <laughs> and, and I think that one of the, hmm, so this is a, this is a separate lecture. But I think that one of the great advantages of mimetic action is that it gives us a tool to live with ambiguity. And I think the attempt to rid the world of ambiguity has led to horrific human disasters. So I think, yes, ambiguity is uncomfortable, right? And the stranger is ambiguous because we don't know what to expect from her or from him. Um, and the gift is ambiguous because what are you giving me when you give me this gift? What is involved in it? Um, but I think the, the challenge, our challenge, is to live with ambiguity rather than try to overcome it and erase it. Because to erase ambiguity is to erase the possibility of creative human life, whatever we might say um, economically. So, I don't disagree with you. Um, what are the resources to live with ambiguity? I think they come within traditions. And I think modernity as a civilizational form has tried excessively, poorly, and with horrible consequences to erase ambiguity. I think that's also connected to sincerity, but that's yet another discussion. Thank you. Muchas gracias a usted, Profesor Selimán. Bueno, un aplauso para esta reunión.